mind hitting the lights at the back, please? So, hi everybody, my name is Mark Cho, I'm co-founder of The Armory. I'm really glad to see so many faces here today. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, today I'd like to welcome a very good friend of mine, a very tall friend of mine, David Marks, who was here a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago, uh, talking about his amazing book, Amatora, uh, which is a history of how Japan brought the Ivy style in and has slowly started to send it back out again. Um, today, David will be giving another brief intro to his book, as well as introducing some vintage Japanese books that he's brought that we actually have available for sale. Um, this event also marks the launch of the Amitora Bookstore. Uh, so after the event, please feel free to go up to the mezzanine and have a look at what we've brought, and uh, they are available for purchase. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for, so much for coming. Uh, this is the second uh, speech I've done here, as uh, Mark said. And so last time, I just went through the whole kind of history uh, of American fashion in Japan through the lens of the book. And this time I thought I would focus on one particular thing, which is how media and magazines have really created American style and, and moved the fashion market forward in Japan. And instead of just talking about that, I wanted to actually show some of these books. And so um, the books I brought on sale are not just Kind of interesting uh, objects from Japan. Uh, a lot of them really, uh, the book, them, the magazines and books themselves were influential to explaining American style in Japan, making Japanese young people uh, really get interested in buying uh, and, and obsessed with American fashion. So um, I'm going to kind of switch between slides and uh, this overhead projector to show some things. If there's questions as, as I'm showing uh, a magazine or book, please feel free to ask. Um, but uh, with, with a lot of this stuff, I think what's really interesting is uh, until very recently with the internet, it was almost impossible for people outside of Japan to see uh, Japanese media and, and magazines. So now a magazine like Popeye, uh, they put things on Instagram and Twitter and you can see images from it. Uh, about five to 10 years ago, Hypebeast and those uh, uh, web magazines are scanning a lot of uh, Japanese catalogs and putting them online. So, what is happening in Japan in fashion is very visible now. But for about 30 or 40 years, all this stuff was happening and it's really interesting and it was almost invisible outside of Japan. So um, the books that I brought today show a lot of that history that still hasn't been seen very much of illustration and photos of, of Japanese style from the times. So, uh, so my book uh, came out in English in 2015 uh, and the Japanese came out in 2017 and ev every time it uh, comes out there's a they changed the title, and so the, the title in, uh, for the traditional Chinese one that came on Taiwan, Hong Kong, is, uh, the translation would be Western Style Japanese Spirit, uh, which is very nice. Uh, but I just got an email from the mainland uh, Chinese publisher who said, we really like that title, uh, but it's never going to sell in China. We're going to call it Harajuku Cowboys. <laughs> And I said, did I write that? <laughs> um, so look out for Harajuku Cowboys, starring Bruce Willis. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. Um, so in the book, what I do is I, I, I look at uh, how American style came to Japan. And it did not come just organically from a bunch of uh, occupation soldiers hanging out in the streets of Tokyo and people copying their style and kind of grew from there. It was this very artificial introduction, which we'll talk about. Um, and so the book looks at the evolution from Ivy League style to then kind of hippie and, and, and countercultural style represented a lot by jeans to this 1970s outdoor based style called heavy duty. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it as, as much tonight, but there was this also rock and roll style that's, that's known in Japan as Yankee uh, now, and then uh, street fashion. Uh, and, and street fashion is really where it all came together and started to be exported first through brands like Bathing Ape and the Harajuku brands and then some of the premium denim brands. And now, you know, we're, we're here at the Armory where there's a poster for Taylor K, the, the Japanese tailor, and, and Ring Jacket. And so really the, the whole wide range of Japanese brands across all the genres are all being exported now. So uh, one of the things about fashion, like if you, if you study fashion from a kind of anthropological or sociological side, there's always a question of where it comes from. And there's fashions that certainly start up from the streets and ones that come down from below. So is fashion top down? Is it bottom up? And in the case of Japan, there's often people overseas see a lot of incredibly crazy styles and think, well, it must be bottom up because these styles are so insane, nobody could be 
constantly pushing them on people. Um, but really, when you look at the history, it's very, very top down. And, and, and most trends, and I would say almost all of them, except for a couple exceptions, start with the media saying, here's the trend, here's how to do it, giving a how-to and instruction on how to do it, uh, and then consumers following that. And the more that magazines were, were basically prescribing that this is how to do it, the more that the, they got great response from consumers and, and said, we want more of that. We want to know exactly what we should be doing. So if you think about uh, something like jeans or Ivy League style, they did not exist in Japan at all. And so you had to explain from zero how to wear these things. You couldn't just look at your neighbors and say, oh, that's how to wear an Oxford uh, button-down shirt. So someone had to explain it, and magazines provided that role. So the, the history of uh, Japanese media and magazines is, is intertwined with the history of Japanese fashion. And a lot of people in Japan have said about my book, it's almost like a, it's more like a media history than a fashion history. Um, but uh, we're going to really see that t today with the example. So, so Ivy League style men's club really invented that uh, and, and had it spread for a lot of the countercultural style. A magazine called Hip on Punch uh, helped spread that as well. Heavy Duty uh, was men's club again, but this particular illustrator, uh, uh, Yasuhiko Kobayashi. For the, the rock and roll stuff, it was kind of a couple different sources, but uh, there was some media that was actually made by the brand Cream Soda. And then street fashion, magazines like Boon and ASEAN in the 90s really uh, pushed that. So the direction of trends uh, is not from the streets uh, and then into the magazines. So an example, this is heavy duty IV style. And you can see on the right uh, in this illustration it is uh, wearing a uh, this the 6040 Sierra Designs parka, the Levi's 501s, the kind of outdoor boots and the plaid shirt. And if you look at the left, you see people literally wearing the exact same thing. So you could see these two and say, oh, so the illustrator like went to the street and said, oh, everyone's wearing this, and then he drew it. Um, but that's not really how it happened if you look at the, the time. So it starts with this illustration. And he did this almost as a parody of like, what if you combine heavy duty style with Ivy style? Did it as a joke. And then people uh, ran out to address exactly how uh, it was in the magazine. So you see this quite a lot. But something will appear in the magazine, and then uh, people will dress exactly like it. OK, so we're going to start with Ivy League style. Um, so the thing about Ivy League style, again, is that uh, it, it did not exist in Japan uh, in the same way that it existed in the United States. So in the 1950s, it was not just big on Ivy League campuses, but all these other college campuses were copying it. Uh, and if you were reading kind of uh, men's industry circulars, Ivy League style was setting a lot of the trends in general in the United States. So in Japan, it didn't exist at all. And there was a brand called Van Jacket that was selling uh, just kind of ready-to-wear clothing in an era where no one really wanted ready-to-wear tailored suits. And uh, so the, a, a magazine started uh, called, it was called Otoko no Fukushoku at first, which is like men's clothing. And then it, it took on the name Men's Club. And, and the idea of this magazine was to teach men how to dress. And more specifically, not, not tailoring, but to have them wear uh, ready-made clothing. And so the, the editors didn't really know what to do, so they called uh, Ishizu from Band Jacket and said, can you help us design this magazine and do the magazine? So we took over all editorial. So from the first issue forward, this isn't just a bunch of editors sitting around, listening to brands, figuring out what to write. It's literally the brands are dictating the content to the magazine, and the magazines are going out and people reading it and uh, buying the clothes and taking the style. So for a while, uh, the men's club uh, was just kind of doing whatever the, the major trends were. You see these kind of really big shoulder jackets. <coughs> Uh, the one on the right is a very famous actor of the era. Um, and then she just takes a, a trip in, in uh, 1960 where uh, he goes around the world and he's looking for a style that he can sell to Japanese youth that he feels like is going to be uh, something that the parents will not be too, super freaked out about, that will make them look proper but still be very youthful. And so he goes to Princeton, he takes these photos of the kids, and he's like, this is the perfect style. This Ivy League style is like cotton and wool, and it's really reasonable, and it, it's youthful, and, and laid back, but at the same time presentable. So they go back, and, and Van Jacket becomes an Ivy League brand. So there's no Ivy League fashion in Japan, and suddenly they say, we're going to be an Ivy League fashion brand. And they've got to create and explain to everyone how to dress Ivy League. So they're making these Ivy League clothing, and they're selling it. So the, a couple problems they have is, number one, uh, you can't look around and see anyone wearing it. 
So the, the world they have to create is not just through the fashion photography in the magazines, but also uh, illustration played a major, major role. And so uh, there's an illustrator, uh, Japan's basically first menswear illustrator, uh, Hozumi Kazuo, Kazuo Hozumi, um, really helped create what the look of IUB was in Japan through his illustrations. And so this is one of his early ones from the mid-60s. So the idea is these are paper dolls of a, um, someone dressing in all the different IV ways you can dress. Um, and uh, including the football helmet and the graduation <laughs> gown and the raccoon coat. <laughs> and then his most famous creation was something that later um, I made it a book that I'll show you, um, but um, the Ivy Boya character. And this is where he took a, uh, this Ivy character and put him in all the different permutations of what you could look like in Ivy Lee clothing. So this came from 1963 and has really set kind of what Ivy looks like in Japan since then. So, I mean, the other thing too is. The, he had never necessarily met people who were, wore these clothing. He just saw them in you know, GQ or Esquire or whatever they could get their hands on, uh, and then copied it. Sorry, let me see the system. Just to mark. Thank you. Um, so you see kind of the, the whole range of IV outfits. He's written these kind of, uh, it's, it's parodying a Kabuki poster, so uh, there's all these names to the right that are um, saying things like Bermuda shorts, uh, but he's writing them in, in Japanese characters. So illustration really uh, kind of sets what uh, IV looks like. And that continues into the, the uh, Ivy League style you know, starts, it's very small. It's, it, if you're reading Men's Club, which became this Ivy League fashion magazine by 64, it's a very small audience. And where it really explodes is through Hey Bon Punch. And Hey Bon Punch was the first youth men's magazine. It started in May 1964. Within a year, it's selling a million copies a week, which you think about today, that I don't know what magazine sells a million copies a week, um, but it, it just took over uh, youth culture in Japan. And from the first issue, this is the cover, and it's by a, a female uh, illustrator named Ohashi Ayumi, um, and it's uh, men wearing these really slim kind of ivy cut suits. And so from here, uh, so many people who had never seen men's club before got introduced to Ivy League fashion. And every week, she did a different cover for these. And so one of the books that got on sale is a collection of all of her covers. <coughs> so, it, uh, so it's showing every week kind of young men dressed in this uh, very uh, chic Ivy style, uh, out on the town, eating, going to the beach, skiing, uh, playing pool, going to jazz clubs, love going with the record <laughs> on the uh, on the trains. Um, so again, really, because nobody's dressing like this out in the streets, they have to invent this whole world through illustration of what it is like and what this lifestyle is like. And she had done this for I think uh, six or seven years. The style gets very hippie later, as you'll see, um, but. Uh, her work has been very, very influential in, in, in kind of defining what that era looks like. So, Hey One Punch happens and, and all these people suddenly know about Ivy League style and they're going out and they're dressing in, in Van Jacket and they're out on the streets of Ginza where it's one of the main places to buy it. And they become known as the Miyuki tribe because the street in, in, uh, in Ginza they're on is called Miyuki Street. Um, and the photos you see here are photos of these kids wearing Ivy League style out on the streets. And you know, the other way in which they created this world for, uh, for young people to see what Ivy League style was like, because it didn't really exist, was to do these street, photo uh, street photos. So street photography gets its real start in Japan in 1963 and 4 in Men's Club, where every week they would go out to Ginza, they would take photos of kids wearing uh, whatever, you know, whoever's wearing a band jacket in a men's club, they would take the photos and put them in the magazine and say to everyone who's the reader, like, see, real people are wearing these clothes. 
So through the history, through the 60s, every week they're taking photos, or every month they're taking these photos, they're curating it to, to basically be the people whose look they approve of, um, and, and suddenly kids say, oh, if I dress up, I can get in the street photos. So they start showing up to in Ginza, and you get this feedback loop where people know if you dress like the magazine, you get in the magazine. And so it, it's this reward structure for dressing people uh, by the instructions that the magazine has. Um, so street photography looks, often looks very bottom up, like we're just documenting the streets. Um, in Japan, it's a long history of kind of being used to have this top down influence. So the Mutant Tribe is, is really where Ivy League style uh, catches on. There was one catch, which is they, they showed up right before the Olympics, and parents who had never seen kids outside of uniforms uh, <laughs> aggregating uh, or kind of amassing on the streets uh, had a complete freak out, and the shop owners had a complete freak out, and they didn't know what to do. Um, so you do what you always do, which is that you arrest them. <laughs> so in September 1964, they send all these plain clothes cops out to um, throw as many members of the Mutant Tribe into a police van as possible uh, and find you know, any crime they can uh, think of to call their parents and get them to stop showing up, uh, which works as long as the Olympics uh, was going on. Um, so, so now you've, you've, Ivy League style has convinced kids to dress like this and they're out on the street. But Van Jacken has a problem that Ivy League style is seen as a delinquent style. So what are they going to do? So the, again, media is their answer. And uh, in May 1965, they go to the Ivy League universities with a film crew and a photographer, and they, they document uh, kids wearing uh, you know, whatever the clothing they're wearing on the Ivy League campuses with the idea of coming back and saying, see, Ivy League style is not the delinquents. These are the most elite. Americans, and it's not this you know insidious style that we're pushing on, on on the nation's children. So, take Ivy is this kind of again propaganda effort um, to make people believe in uh, the power of Ivy League style. And so, this book was originally supposed to be a film to show the distributors, and and, and uh, but it's the book and the photos that went in the magazine that are really uh, the legacy. And so, this book was released in, in uh, the United States in 2010 uh, in English for the first time. And, uh, has been a kind of runaway hit, and it's famous world over. But you know, it was it was not created just because of we are really interested in Ivy League style. We went to the Ivy League campuses. It was a business who had a business need to help the brand, uh, and and they went off and did Take Ivy. And so I've got a um, Japanese reprint of Take Ivy here from 1980 um, that I brought. Um, it had been reprinted kind of through the years, but the 1965 one was the first one. Um, so these are some street photos from the Take Ivy party, so everyone was dressed in their magic jackets. And you can see now that you're starting to get not just this renegade Ivy, but this very um, properly dressed set of uh, Ivy, Ivy League kids. Uh, and by 1966, you know, 1965 or 60, you get, you know, just go to the streets and people are, uh, kids aren't just wearing their uniforms, but they're really wearing all of this Ivy League stuff. You see a guy with a band jacket. Uh, bag, which was the cool thing to carry around at the time. So Van Jacka kind of single-handedly brings Ivy League fashion to Japan, uh, and it's all in the model of what was shown in Men's Club. And so it, you know, later you can look through some of the Men's Club issues that I brought, but it's a, it's a really interesting mix of, of photos um, and illustrations and tutorials and lots of guides that are saying, like, do not get slanted pockets, because those are anti-Ivy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so they're, uh, they're much more like textbooks than I think magazines here are, and um, uh, especially in the past, the GQ used to be used a lot like, I mean, you know about that. I don't have to tell you about that, because I know, you know that. But in Japan, it's like, you will sit down and listen to my instructions. Um, so um, that was a lot of the Ivy stuff. I'm going to show one more thing, which is when um, Ivy kind of came back in the 80s, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, <coughs> Kazuo Hozomi is Japan's first menswear illustrator uh, and the originator of that character, the Ivy Boy. They came out with Ivy Illustrated, which is a whole book of just the Ivy Boy wearing the year's wardrobe of Ivy League styles. And this book, I think, is probably the most comprehensive collection of what Ivy League style looks like. Uh, we have like, some some photos somewhere, but it's never been cataloged quite as well as this, uh, although they are illustrations. Sorry. You just need a full book. 
Um, so, so basically, this whole book is just every possible uh, Ivy League uh, outfit that you could wear. I'm the same character. <laughs> so this is fall. This is all the village people. <laughs> Got summer. There's a there's a woman's companion as well. A, a book that's all just Ivy girls. Um, and here's your summer suit. There's the Tom Wolf right there. Um, and then there's lots of explanations, but it's all these illustrations from, from Hozumi, and this book is uh, iconic, it's been reprinted through the years, but uh, really, uh, <laughs> it's got a uh, and it has all the history of, of, of where it all came from. Um, there's some interesting, he also does more kind of, uh, he's a very talented illustrator, like too kind of indie style, and in the, in the back he's doing more uh, Peter Paul and Mary. And, uh, <laughs> So, um, so this came out in 1980, but it's it's really um, probably one of the, the best illustrated examples of what ID looks like. Okay, so heavy duty. So uh, countercultural style. So hippie style got pretty big in the late 60s. Again, there are no uh, necessarily Japanese hippies around. They have to be created from zero. <laughs> and you know, how do people find out what hippies look like? Because Japanese TV isn't sending crews around the world to shoot the latest in, in Greenwich Village style or East Village style. Um, but what happened was, Hey Bon Punch, the magazine I showed you before, sent a illustrator and a writer, uh, or just an illustrator and an editor actually, around the world to document uh, what uh, countercultural style looked like. And he, they would do sketches and send them back every week to be in the magazine. And so uh, this illustrator, uh, Yas Yasuhiko Kobayashi, who had, um, um, he had been an illustrated men's club, actually, and, and part of the Ivy thing, but then he, he grew his hair out and became a hippie as he went to uh, Ashbury in 67. So he did a book, and uh, so this column in the Hip Hop Punch every week, he would go and they would find some trend, and he would write an essay kind of explaining it. So this is uh, uh, tie-dye, uh, and these are uh, guys who wear uh, uh, tight pants. <laughs> um, and explain kind of all these different uh, hippie trends. These were the people in Tokyo who were dressing in the Saint Germain style of Paris. Uh, and so a lot of the Japanese hippies were seeing this and they were getting ideas for how to dress. Um, there's a famous rock star who apparently uh, would look at this every week and tell his stylist to go out and get whatever was there. Um, and so this is the mechanism in which hippie style really spread and, and it, it definitely got big um, in Japan at the time. Um, so Kobayashi was famous for this, and then he becomes much more uh, famous later. Um, he got married into backpacking and the kind of back to earth thing. So he and a bunch of other editors in um, 1974 took over a skiing magazine and turned it into a basically ski consumer lifestyle magazine. It was a big hit. And so for the next thing they said, let's go to the United States and let's try to capture as a time capsule all the stuff that's in the United States. And they made this thing called the Made in USA Catalog. It came out in 1975. Um, and it is literally 300 pages of stuff. Uh, and these are very rare. I brought, I have one and I have the sequel, um, and I was able to get these, but they're, they're relatively hard to find in Japan. Uh, and you'll see the cover is the 501 uh, Levi's, which is basically what made the Levi's 501 the, the gold standard of jeans in Japan. Um, and so if you look through this, uh, so it kind of starts, Mark? Uh, I mean, first of all, it starts talking about, uh, in America, people who are really in the magazines are called catalog freaks. Uh, I don't know if that's true. But, um, <laughs> so uh, it starts with a lot of clothes, and, this, and it looks kind of um, maybe, maybe familiar. Uh, but you know, they have Jay Press in here, and then Abercrombie Fitch. They've got all of this uh, here from uh, rodeo stuff, they've got football helmets. And then from there, uh, it really starts getting into everything. So we've got fishing lures, uh, cars, red wing boots. If you wonder why red wing boots are so big in Japan, it really starts here. Uh, sleeping bags, camping gear, 
knives, guns, fishing rods, backpacks, sunglasses. Um, and then the back, they literally just reprinted a camping <laughs> <laughs> from the United States. They're just like, catalogs are so great. So they, they were all obsessed with catalogs. Um, and the whole thing about this magazine is that none of it is purchasable. So it's not like a catalog, like, it, like yes, I would like the Eddie Bauer fleece vest in, in powder blue. Like, none of this is orderable. So there's prices in dollars. So this is $329, but you can't buy it because it's not available in Japan. Uh, but it's literally just a thing of stuff. And uh, it sold incredibly well because people just want to see, just wanted to see stuff. Now, there's often a question of kind of like, are, you know, are the Jap were the Japanese at the time really materialist and focused on things? Uh, wasn't there an attempt to also teach them about kind of lifestyle? Because if you think about the 70s, it's really about this you know, hippie ethos uh, and going back to nature and veg vegetarianism and health food and nud nudist colonies. Um, but this, the, the thing I just showed you is just stuff. And what's interesting is when the, when the uh, Made in the USA catalog did well, a rival publisher came out with the Dew catalog, and they got an American editor to make it. So this is much more what an American would do with the same material. And his has no stuff in it, uh, and it's just kind of like uh, lifestyle and uh, naked people in hot tubs, <laughs> uh, and and lots of kind of hippie '70s values. Um, and this sold way way worse. So people, <laughs> people wanted to see the stuff. Is that a cigarette? Um, so here's yoga. So this is actually probably more interesting. Yeah, here's some naked people in a hot tub. Um, so this is probably more interesting to someone in the United States because it's a great catalog of actually what life was like in 1976, uh, whereas the other one is a, a catalog of just uh, stuff. Uh, if you're making a reproduction line, maybe that's useful to you. Uh, but that kicks off this uh, outdoor boom. So people get really into American outdoor gear, um, and it culminates in this, what I showed you before, this heavy-duty Ivy style. So on the streets, everybody's dressed like um, there was some sort of uh, emergency Coast Guard accident, and then uh, uh, everyone's uh, on it. They're, 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 um, saving people in the water as we speak. Um, and so heavy duty, uh, men's club was actually one of the big kind of pushers of heavy duty, so that heavy duty ID piece was in, in men's club. And here's a whole issue that's just about the heavy duty style from uh, 1976. Um, so if you take a look at this later, sorry, show you this. Um, so you've got illustrations from uh, uh, Yasuhiko Kobayashi of kind of how to wear Things. Um, you've got a lot of, a lot of outdoor Canadian sweaters, down vests, uh, but they told, turned this kind of outdoor lifestyle into uh, a, a fashion look. So for many years, uh, men's club was not Ivy. It was a lot of people in, in, in beards, <laughs> a lot of thick flannel boots. Um, so this is a really, really great catalog of um, what the 1970s outdoors style was for North Americans. Anyway. Then you also have some photos, some great kind of street photos. They, you know, through the years, would go to places like the University of Colorado or back to the Ivy League campuses and shoot what the students were wearing there as well. So these are really great records of American life as well as the Japanese version. Now. Um, UCLA, as you saw there, people got very into that. And the editors of the main USA catalog went on to make a magazine called Popeye. And instead of just doing the heavy duty thing and the, the winter and the beards, they decided to really focus on the California sun and frisbee and surfing and, and, and that lifestyle. So Popeye starts as a California themed magazine and it leads to the surfing boom in Japan. So the surfing has had a, a, a bit of a start, uh, but even the surfing is, is society in Japan real, uh, kind of writes down that uh, it was because of Popeye that people started really surfing. And so from there you get um, also things like uh, people are very into sneakers. So this is a really rare item as well. It's a sneaker catalog from 1978. Um, and it's just full of 
every single sneaker that was available at the time. Um, get to some of the sneaker pages. So some of these are, um, here's a Pepsi sneaker that you did not know existed. <laughs> um, but the, the real sneaker boom, you know, sneakers came in in the 60s, but this is where the Japanese obsession with sneakers really starts. So Nike was very hot at the time, uh, jogging and uh, tennis. So the, the other thing you'll notice with Popeye and all these magazines is that Japanese magazines are often called kind of catalog, catalog magazines. And, and Made in the USA Catalog taught them that this is what readers wanted. They just wanted to see stuff. But no articles, just lots and lots of things. And so what you also see in these magazines is the degree to which there's just like, you know, a hundred things on a page because that's what the readers have really requested. Um, so when Japan has gotten so good at making these magazines, pumping them out every month, the Popeye Men's Club, and uh, they're following American trends more closely than Americans at this point. So by the late 70s, uh, Van Jacket goes bankrupt, and you do uh, Popeye did, does what every uh, magazine does when a brand has a horribly embarrassing bankruptcy, which is they put it on the cover. <laughs> so they did an issue uh, that's kind of like, thanks a lot, Van. Like, yes, you were bankrupt, but you taught us everything about Ivy League style, and, and really, you know, there would be no Popeye without Van. Uh, so they put Van on the cover after it's gone bankrupt. Uh, and a lot of kids who knew nothing about Ivy League style from the 60s said, this, this Ivy League style is great. So there's a new IV kind of boom that happens uh, as, as Van goes under. But it wasn't as much um, uh, IV as preppy. So Men's Club uh, had gone in uh, early 1979 to the United States on a tour to take photos. And uh, they found this poster that you'll see. It says, Are You a Preppy? Uh, which was a famous kind of parody poster of uh, preppy style. Uh, that I think came out of the University of Virginia. Uh, and they bought the poster, and they, they did a little, like, four pages in the back of an issue. Like, uh, we found this thing called Preppy Style. It's kind of interesting. And everyone wrote in and said, we want to know more about Preppy Style. So in uh, December 1979, they did a whole issue uh, called What is Preppy? And if you have followed American fashion history, uh, there's a preppy boom in America caused by the official preppy handbook that Lisa Bernbach made. And that came out in uh, October 1980. So about 10 months before the American preppy boom started, uh, Japan was already having its own preppy moment. So Japan at this point understands American style better than America. <laughs> and this whole issue uh, goes through you know, all of what preppy style is, how it's different than uh, Ivy League style, uh, how it's changed, uh, and it gives you kind of a guide to dressing like a preppy. You're so smiley. Um, so everyone shaved the beards, um, and they're, they're back to being clean cut. Um, this is a great example of what a Japanese magazine is like. If you haven't seen one, so they're taking a single button-down shirt here and showing you every single minor detail of what makes it special of how the buttons are sewn, uh, and how the, what the placket looks like, and all sorts of things. Um, so this guide is, is your guide to wearing uh, preppy style, and uh, we have it on sale for you to learn. Um, okay. So the, the official preppy handbook comes out the official preppy handbook comes out in Japan. It's a big hit. Um, you see it here, Hot Dog Press, which was Popeye's rival. Um, their publisher put it out and made a really big deal of it. Um, but you know, preppy came in for a couple of years. Um, so to give you a sense of how Ivy in Japan in the 60s looked different than preppy in the 80s, uh, the person on the right is wearing this 60s Ivy style. I call it the school, school play production of Death of a Salesman look. <laughs> and the one on the left is the Raging Kegger Steve Bannon three shirt look. <laughs> <laughs> and who would you rather have your party? Let's be honest. Um, so Ivy 80 with Preppy really, really.
the changes. This is a this is from Hot Dog Press. Uh, and then you get the preppy boom on the street. And if you know the brands Ships and Beams that are big in Japan now, um, they got very, very big as importers of American clothing, and they got big during the preppy style for wearing, making these sweatshirts, which they no longer make. Um, uh, but uh, Ships and Beams, the whole fortune was kind of tied to the preppy boom. So finally, you know, one of the other things that I want to talk about is where uh, premium denim comes from in Japan, and the media have big part to play in that. So I showed you uh, the Made in USA catalog before, and it had the 501 on the cover. Um, and the 501, the way it's, uh, I'll show it to you again, the way that it, it looks on the cover of this magazine is that you can see the kind of way it fades. And people looked at this, and then they looked at the new 501s that were being made in the 80s, and they had, they had started using a different kind of sp uh, thread spinning and dyeing process, and they just weren't as good. And so everybody remembered this, and they looked back at this and said, why aren't the Levi's 501s as good as they used to be? And so Japanese brands got very, very into trying to create their own version of the 501. Um, and the other thing that happened was, even though the kind of back to nature, really uh, down to earth 501 outdoor boom ended, in the early 80s, uh, magazines were pushing Italian and French casual, and they noted that uh, Italian and French teenagers loved the 501. So the 501 was kind of seen as the universal standard for jeans. Um, and, and during uh, this time in the United States, the 501 actually had kind of died off. People weren't wearing it that much. It wasn't until 84 when uh, there's, a, there's a famous uh, 501 ad that Levi started running again, and that really kicked off the 501 boom. And Bruce Willis is in it, if you want to take a look on, on YouTube. Um, but so the 501, people are obsessing about it in Japan. And uh, brands in the early 80s start to, to notice a couple things about the, the 501 that makes it special, the old ones, which is they have salvaged denim um, instead of just normal denim. And so you get Japanese brands starting to make salvaged denim jeans. And one of the first ones was uh, Studio Dark Sun. These went for $200 or $300. Um, and they were a total abject failure at the time. Uh, nobody bought them, but uh, brands started to get into this idea of we're going to make salvage denim and we're going to make a denim that feels like a 1950s denim. And it's good to understand that the salvage, the, if you don't know what it is, it's the thing at the bottom of the jean. Um, it, and you can only have salvage denim when you make the denim on these very, very narrow looms. And in the United States, this practice had stopped. So by uh, 1983, the Le Levi stopped using any salvage denim that's 501. It, it only used it really in the 501, and they kept doing it until 1983. So the salvage denim was about to die as a practice. And uh, Japan started reviving it in its uh, obsession with the 501. Uh, Levi's Japan was the first Levi's around the world to make a reproduction model. Uh, so this happened in 1985 or 1986. They, they made this copy of the 701. Uh, and this was also a big failure. People were very upset about it. <laughs> and uh, so what was happening at the time is uh, there was a huge demand for dead stock Levi's because people wanted those classic 1950s and 60s Levi's. And so you had this, this mass of Japanese buyers going to the United States, going to uh, Pennsylvania steel towns, and going to the workwear outfitters and being like, do you have any old stock? They're like, oh, we have these like 60s uh, Levi's that no one's ever bought. Like they're $9. And they're like, yeah, can I get um, 200 pairs of those? <laughs> so very, very quietly and secretly, there's this army of Japanese buyers and pickers who are taking all of the dead stock workwear out of the United States and sending it back to Japan. So for they're buying it for $9, and the stores are first selling it for like $50, and $100, then $200, and $300. And by the late 80s, uh, at somewhere like Banana Boat, where you can still go today in Harajuku and you can buy uh, dead stock 1966 Levi's, they start going for two or three thousand dollars. So the, the there's huge demand for this magazine boon for for used clothing, uh, sorry for for vintage and dead stock jeans, and you you couldn't get it anymore because it's just it's running out. There's only a finite supply, um, but to kind of give you a sense of how maniacal people were getting about vintage jeans and how to date vintage jeans, 
This is an issue of Boone from the 90s uh, that goes through kind of the history of, of, of Levi's. And this is probably uh, much more detailed than what Levi's had at the time. Um, so they're looking at all the different old models. And they have these jeans collectors who have thousands of pairs were donating their pairs to show off the different um, styles. But what's, what's most fascinating is with Levi's, so I love this page, so it's all the different ta uh, tags and what years and what they looked like uh, with the incredible kind of anthropological precision. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you have this small marking, then it's, uh, it's the 501, 501 from 66 to 68, not the 501, 501, 0, 1, 1, 7. So, when this is happening, this level of detail of understanding how to date uh, vintage jeans and to know what you're getting when you go to the United States and you are buying the 66 model, um, no one in the United States has any idea of anything. And so it's, it, there's a bunch, I've heard from a lot of different American uh, stores at the time who would see Japanese uh, buyers just look, look at stuff and look at the salvage and like, what are, you, what are you looking at? Like, oh, I'm just, just, just browsing. <laughs> can I get 500 of these? Um, <laughs> and so really like this whole, whole thing is happening at this level of precision and no one in America knows what's going on until kids uh, from like small towns who are trying to buy for their small town shops would take their issues of Boone or whatever and go to the rag houses and be like, do you have this? And the rag houses started looking and they're like, what is this magazine? And they're like, that goes for $3,000? <laughs> Like they've been selling it for like bulk, you know, uh, ten dollars for forty pounds or something. So, uh, you know, basically the price has been skyrocket. And where, um, where really the reproduction lines boom because they were kind of failures in the eighties. Where they boom is in the nineties with Evie Sue, the brand. Finally, just it became so impossible to get a vintage-like jean in Japan. Um, because you couldn't get the ones from the United States anymore, they're too expensive, and so they, they made a $200 or $300 reproduction model that felt like a really good 1950s uh, pair of Levi's, and so Evie Sue caught on. Oops, that's the end. Um, but this, uh, this culture was really, really pushed, uh, and Evie Sue in particular is interesting because <coughs> it wasn't really the fashion magazines that got the start for these reproduction lines. It was a magazine called uh, Mono, which is, it means stuff, these things, and it's just a magazine every every month of things. And um, one of the things they got into was reproduction jeans. And that publisher actually had never been a fashion publisher. It had been uh, a publisher mostly of uh, books about American military vehicles and jets and tanks. And so there's this kind of um, people obsessed with American military and occupation era things. And that's the, the first group who really got into these reproduction. Uh, models of jeans, but then Boone picked it up and, and introduced it to, uh, as part of street fashion. And when I first went to Tokyo in, in 1998, that, that was the style that everybody had a perfect pair of, of dark denim selvage uh, and a, a perfect vintage t-shirt and the perfect kind of, uh, Nike or Adidas. Um, and I remember you could not buy dark denim in the United States basically at that time uh, or in Japan for the last you know, eight years before that. That was the, the boom, and then I remember the gap in 1999 finally kind of re reintroduced uh, dark denim. Uh, so Japan just had this incredible fashion culture going on that no one had seen, and then finally from the late 90s, and Evie Sue starts getting exported through Hong Kong to England and lots of places, and the rap community gets into it, and then Bathing Ape, which had first been kind of an American vintage reproduction brand of sorts uh, with street fashion, uh, gets exported into the hip hop community and becomes huge, and so now. Uh, really, uh, anything that's being you know made in Japan, you can either buy it online or just buy it in stores. You can go to Bloom and Green up the street, um, or South Edge or around the world, and buy these, these these things, and you can see what's in Papa Magazine and everything. But um, the kind of 40 years before that, and there's so much rich content. Um, it's almost uh, it hasn't been seen, I'm, and I'm working really hard to see if I can't create some more publications that show some of these images. But at least for, for today, I've brought all these magazines and books, and I'm very excited for you to go through them and, and, and look at, at uh, what's in there, the photos and the illustration. So I'm happy to answer questions, but that was kind of the end of my presentation. So thank you so much.
So you know, they would take trips almost like monthly or every six months to the Ivy League campuses and uh, UCLA and all these places. And so they would ask, talk to the students, they would go to the, the, the uh, campus store, the university stores, and talk to people. I've got one issue of Men's Club upstairs. It says, <coughs> the issue is American traditional style. And they have a photo, like street photos from Phillips Andover. So they went to like Parents Weekend at Phillips Andover, <laughs> and they've taken all these pictures of the parents with their kids. Um, and it's funny that the parents are all like in this really 70s Ivy style, these big mattress jackets with huge lapels, and the kids are all like looking like John Travolta. They have like a, you know spread spread uh, shirt with two buttons down and and, and everything. So um, the kids are a little less preppy than, than the parents were, but. Um, yeah, in the 80s, and, uh, you'll, you'll see it there, they were going to campuses and shooting. You know, like, take Ivy, it's 1965, but they continued that practice the whole time. So the greatest record of American collegiate style is, does not exist in America, it exists in Japan. Um, so I was just in Washington, D.C., and I'm talking to the Library of Congress right now about trying to put those materials into the Library of Congress. Um, they have a great Japanese collection, but as almost the uh, history of America, it's very important for that to be in the Library of Congress. So, um, very detailed on the ground research. Uh, Benny. I don't know everyone's name, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So in the book, I, I deal with this more um, specifically, but everything I've showed you in this kind of system of the magazines and the brands working together, it really is to an upper middle class, uh, somewhat urban audience. And a lot of people outside of urban areas who are upper middle class uh, or middle class who are worried about, I'm not in Tokyo and I don't know what the style in Tokyo is like, so I will follow whatever's in Popeye, knowing that that is the correct advice, because you can't look around you and see how people are dressed. But it's definitely um, the upper scale. Uh, and there's actually not that many people in Japan. I mean, it's, it's not a small amount, but it's, it's not the largest amount of people. There are more working class people in Japan, like, like anywhere. And uh, there was a specific working class style called Yankee that I did not talk about um, that doesn't have a, a, an infrastructure of magazines. And the magazines that did exist for that, that culture, so there's one called Teens Road, which was um, the, men, the men's one is it's called something else, but it's you know hot rod cars and uh, motorcycles that have been altered and, and people dressing in weird right wing paramilitary uniforms. Uh, and then the women's version is Teens Road, which is women bikers, um, and they're fascinating, but they're they're really expensive and hard to buy because these books were you know came out from kind of third fourth rate publishers. Uh, they couldn't get advertisers, and because there's really no commercial market around. So these magazines exist because there's a commercial marketplace to push the product on the, the kids, but when it's the working class, more organic style, there's less of a media infrastructure, and it is much more um, subcultural in the true meaning of the word subculture. Um, so uh, everything you've seen is kind of this very uh, college-educated, uh, upper-middle-class world, and uh, it, it is often confused that Japan, uh, all of Japan is like that, and the reverence towards American style is a, is a Japanese virtue, but it is very much an upper middle class mediated virtue. Thank you. The catalog style print culture you're talking about, is that still true today, <coughs> or has that gone away? So magazines are definitely struggling, but they're not, but they're still around. In a way that in America, I think so many of them have just disappeared, and they're, they're really, really struggling, and or they've moved to a web plus print model. Um, Popeye only really recently started doing web stuff, and they still don't put very much online. Uh, they just have a little bit on Instagram. Um, I think the difference is that when it's mostly content, so when you think about GQ, <coughs> there's like great articles in GQ that come out, or Esquire, right? and you read the articles. But these magazines aren't really meant for reading articles. They're, they're catalogs of stuff. And catalogs of stuff, it's just, it's still, a really great experience to open a catalog and to flip through it. So there's something functional about that. And there's also something uh, that it's not just information, it is legitimized information. So people know that, okay, if these five t-shirts are here and I wear that t-shirt, I'm not gonna get in trouble. And so one of the things you often hear from designers is that they'll make a t-shirt in red and black and in the magazine they only feature the black one. 
And kids will come to the store and they'll only buy the black ones and they will not buy the red ones. So the function of magazines is not just its stuff, it is that if it's in paper form, it must be legitimate and serious in a way that I think online, especially in Japan, where it's, um, it's not a particularly internet friendly uh, society, which kind of sounds odd, but uh, they waited a long time to really embrace the internet. And um, people have the doubts about things on the internet, and, it's, and things on the internet are often bottoms up, and what the desire was is to get top down authoritative information. So it just works less. Talk about the top to bottom effect. When was the first time in Japan that sort of Japanese teenagers started to say, you know, fuck this, you know, we're going to go bottom to top now? When was the first time they sort of, when was the first indigenous Japanese youth subculture? So I, I think the working class subculture is that much better. So the motorcycle gangs, for example, the Bosozoku, they're wearing a combination of Hawaiian shirts and leather jackets and jeans and women's heels, which is like a very strange thing. But, um, they were just wearing whatever to piss people off. And for a while in the early early 70s, you could wear American stuff and it still was kind of scary, but then there was a boom for 50s American style. And so, like if you read Anna, which was this cool woman's fashion magazine, they, they were having the 50s stuff. And so then they had to kind of pivot and say, okay, that doesn't work anymore, we need to think we're gonna piss people off. So that's when they started dressing in right wing paramilitary with these huge kind of imperialist slogans that they didn't really believe in, but they're like, it's a hippie era. And uh, who do upper middle class kids hate the most? They hate the right wing, so we'll dress like the right wing. And so there are these motorcycle gangs called Hitler and Nazi. And, uh, <laughs> what, you, what year was that? That's the, the, the military uniforms, I think, started like 76, 77, maybe. It's in my book, and I have to find the specific date. Um, and those, those paramilitary uniforms are actually cleaning uniforms. Um, so also the crossover between wearing your working class janitorial, you know, they're working blue collar jobs at 16, they dropped out of high school, and um, they're kind of using a lot of the janitorial uh, gear that they wear, plus you know whatever's scary, and they've got their hair and, and uh, curled and you know permed and, and put up with grease. Um, so that that movement was not at all dictated by the media. So there's a band called Carol that that was in the media a little bit that inspired a lot of them uh, with the rock and roll book. And so there was media involvement, but it wasn't prescribed. So I would say that that fits that very well, whereas the stuff that's the upper middle class media and stuff is very uh, top down. Um, so is, it, is there like a step up here? No, you're, you're okay. Is there sort of like Yeah, so I mean, at this point, everything that's ever existed in America probably has some sort of weird cult in, in Japan. Um, there was a time in, I want to say 2003 or four, where band t-shirts were really big, so Boone had this big issue with band t-shirts. And they had on the, in the cover, like one of the main images was this Dinosaur Junior t-shirt from the 90s that like when, it, when I was a kid, I really wanted. And it, I would walk around and you would see everyone in the same Dinosaur Junior t-shirt. So it wasn't like all Dinosaur Junior t-shirts or all grunge t-shirts are cool. It was like that one green mind t-shirt is in. Um, so yeah, there's places you can go that only sell that kind of vintage stuff. There's uh, you know, Better Better Jean in Harajuku. It's only vintage Levi's 501s in the basement. Or like there's the ET. ET. Yeah. There's an ET, but I'm sure. Yeah. Um, there's a uh, there's a place called Dog in Harajuku that I don't know if they still did, so but, gross. but like <laughs> they only had acid wash jeans for a long time. Um, so you, like anything that's ever existed in America, the reason you probably can't buy it is it's in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> So his 
this character is really, really popular, and so once in a while, companies will come and say, let's do something with it. Um, there's an insurance company that had a poster one year that used his art. And so his stuff shows up quite a bit. Um, so I think those were made kind of like, let's make a plastic model. A lot of stuff in Japan is, um, before it's put into production, they kind of get specific orders of how many they can sell, and they only make that many. Um, records used to be like that. So if you a record came out like a week later, you were like, I want that record. Like, like it's been gone. It's never reprinted. And so um, the problem is, yeah, if you want stuff, sometimes if it's gone, it is gone. But yeah, I think they just, they did a plastic version. There's, there's not been a deeper story. But. Yep, sorry for me. Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, <coughs> it's interesting, but I mean, it, it's a little more top down than I thought from like, a corporate standpoint, but there's still an element of like, a long history of basically people looking at America who are not American, having a more insightful view of the aesthetic, of the ethos, than the American. So I, I, I guess to what extent is this taught aspiration? the fact that they feel like outsiders to a certain society, and, and they have this aspiration of, of fitting in to an aesthetic, into a, an educational mold, into a socioeconomic level, whatever it is, um, and the fact that they're outsiders, and because of that, they kind of understood the ethos better than Americans did. Yeah, I think it's some of it. I mean, obviously, you don't understand your own culture until you're outside of it, or you see a different culture that's operating differently and say, wait a minute, I didn't know that I did, did things that way. Um, I grew up in the South, and uh, when I say, you know, when you write with a pen, uh, I'd say pen. I just never thought about it until I went up north, and people were like, pen, you want a pen? <laughs> so um, you've got to, you have to like get outside of it. So when you're outside of Ivy League style, you're trying to like transcribe like what is it and explain it to people, you can get very detailed and, and be a great observer. At the same time, because they had to explain it to people, uh, they had to get really prescriptive and say, this is how to do it. And so if people were following it to the, to the letter, it's because they were so panicked about, am I doing it right? Uh, and so they're following the instructions. And so if you have a culture that's building and building and people are trying to outdo each other and who's more authentic, then it gets deeper and deeper. Is that appreciation for it? I don't know. I think there's, a, there's social structures that build that competition in without it being let me, just, yeah. let me just clarify my question. It's more of the fact that is this a pure aesthetic copy and paste and they like the aesthetic of it, or did they like the idea of the fact that you had this Ivy League culture, this crappy culture in the United States that appreciated certain things about, you know, freedom, individuality, all the things that we kind of consider uh, American values? Right. So I would say for the editors and the people at the brands, absolutely. And the editors of Popeye when they did the issues about California, they would often say like, we want to be American. Like being Japanese is not fun and being American seems like so much fun, so we want to be American. That being said, the kids, I don't believe that they have the same kind of aspiration because um, if you take Ivy League uh, style, for example, so Ishizu Kinsuke who brought Ivy League style to Japan, he really got it because he had grown up old money, he had gone to an old money school, right. he saw Princeton and was like, I get this. Like, you know, um, one of the things that Ivy League colleges in the 60s was the more torn up your loafers were, the cooler it was. And that's it, the same principle existed in Japan at, at very um, elite schools. And so he got it, and he would make a big point of Ivy League style is not just the stuff, it is a lifestyle. It is a way of living, it's a way of, uh, of work and play and being serious and all that. And every time he would do that, the consumers would just be like, yeah, whatever, we want the stuff. And then in the 70s, the same thing, uh, he came back in the 80s, I uh, got an issue of Hot Dog Press where he came back, back and did a big style guide to Ivy when he was in his like, 60s. And um, he again, it was like, in the 60s it was too much about stuff, but this time it's a lifestyle, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, give me the stuff. So I, don't know. I think that's one proof point. The other would be that um, if you were Japanese and, and seeing these magazines, you were seeing a lot of times Japanese models were in Japanese brands and Japanese magazines you go to a Japanese store with Japanese staff yeah. selling Japanese stuff. So at which point, it, it, yes, the original form was American, but at that point it's it's really rooted. So um, I think it's a great question and it's it, there's a tension there and the people I think who brought it definitely had that aspiration, but whether uh, it spread because of the aspiration, I think we should be careful about that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So can you kind of, I guess, expand on that a bit and, and talk about so in terms of being a lifestyle, in terms of being more than that, so I know you mentioned surfing and that kind of briefly took off, but were people actually buying kayaks? Were they buying, <laughs> <laughs> were, were, I mean, like how much of it, and did that influence policy?
policy? Was there an environmental push at, or a national park movement? I mean, can you talk about the larger context about how that might have influenced things? Yeah, I mean, so that's the other big debate about all of this, which is when you bring in, let's say, hippie aesthetics, and there's a form of hippie aesthetics, but there's a content of hippie aesthetics, which is, in, in the United States, we understand that the content is, is creating the form. So, hey, we're going back to nature, so we're going to grow beards out, and we're going to eat healthy food, and we're going to be nudists, or whatever. So there's a philosophy and a belief, and the forms fall from that. When the forms are, are uh, imported into Japan, there isn't a lot of context for the content. And even if they explain it, it's not as catchy as just the form itself. And so for a long time, there has been kind of a, um, a debate about whether Japanese who are adopting, who are into jazz, get jazz, or who are adopting Ivy League style, get Ivy League style, or they're just learning this stuff. And even the editors or the people who, who run the brands are very skeptical that the kids get it. Um, and for a long time, Americans saw that, and you would see the rock and roll dancers I mean, this was really famous until recently. I mean, so the idea that people were reverent about Japanese fashion is a very new idea. It's happened in the last 20 years. And there's so many examples of in the, in the 70s and 80s where Americans would go and they'd see the rock and roll dancing kids, who it didn't show uh, in this presentation, and they're all dancing in order. Um, and the men are dancing by themselves, and the women are dancing by themselves. And it's very alien to see rock and roll, which is supposed to be this rebellious thing, done in this very kind of orderly, performative way. And so it was like, you don't get it. And so there's like, I found in the book all these examples of American journalists just like uh, hating on the Japanese kids for like, you are doing American style, but you don't get it. So the, the, your question is, did, did they get it or not? Did being back to nature lead to an environmental movement? There was definitely an environmental movement in the 70s, but it's very detached from the consumerism of it. Um, and if you look at me in USA, I mean, I think that's a great example of where they imported this whole uh, lifestyle of Americans without the life. It's just the stuff. And so uh, I'm, I'm more on the side of no, the content really didn't change people's minds, the philosophy didn't change people's minds. Um, it, it was just uh, the adoption of forms. And the, the, those forms in Japan happened to play a social role in the status hierarchies of young people, and that's why they adopted them. But uh, if there was any kind of change in mind, uh, there was no way to act upon it. And maybe that's a better way to think about it. Even if they wanted to be hippies and drop out and be nudist colonies, there was very, very, there was fewer opportunities to do that in, in Japan than in the United States. Uh, so you, and then. Uh, I noticed uh, on some of the slides, the crisis for magazines from the 60s and 70s, maybe like six or something in, four or something in. By today's uh, exchange standards, that's very, very expensive to yep. from that era. So I was wondering, um, like price-wise, how accessible were these things to be able to sell a million a week? That you know, I think I think Hip on Punch was accessible. Uh, that was like a normal price for a magazine. Uh, Men's Club was relatively expensive. When Take Ivy, the book came out, that was a really relatively expensive item. Um, but the, you know, the clothing was also incredibly expensive, and uh, you know, it, again, it's like we look back and say like. Japanese men were wearing Ivy League style. It really, the, the only the very, very top children of upper middle class families and upper class families were wearing it. And um, Japan doesn't have like a like a particularly robust conversation about class. Um, and you, books about fashion just tend to say um, all this stuff is the this, this is fashion history and kind of ignores what else is going on. But uh, it's a good point that. that Things were very expensive. I mean, music is a is a clear example where buying an LP in Japan in the in the sixties was like basically equivalent of fifty or sixty dollars. Mm -hmm. So buying one LP was out of out of reach for most people. And uh, so you would go to, to rock and jazz cafes and just listen to records there because you couldn't afford to, to buy them yourselves. And it wasn't until really the eighties or nineties when people could afford to, to buy their own <coughs> collections. And and so the the taping culture of um, yeah, record rental places uh, started in, in Japan in the, in the 70s because no one could afford to buy the records. So they would go and, and rent it and then tape uh, and listen to it on cassettes. So, um, yeah, it's a good point. It, it's, it, it was definitely limited because of the high prices. Last one. Last one. Uh, what do you see the future of Japanese publications given you know, the prevalence of online sites for 
Yeah, I mean, they've lasted a lot longer than you would assume. Um, there's still so many magazines. Uh, and I don't know I don't know who reads them. <coughs> um, I think they, they just exist. And so um, a lot of their circulation figures are completely invented. I mean, that's true in the United States as well. But um, it's a... It's strange. I think Popeye is a, is a good one to watch because it has gotten a lot of attention in Taiwan and Hong Kong and the rest of Asia as well as in, in the US and UK. And they're starting to make an effort of how can we international, internationalize more. And so if you know the, the images that they, they make and the editorials they do are very special and I feel like the world would be a worse place if it didn't exist. So I, I hope a lot of these magazines continue. Um, but in general, Youth consumerism has been down every year. There's fewer young people in Japan than ever. It's a really old country. And uh, the other thing is, if you go to Harajuku, you know, when I used to, again, when I first went to Tokyo in 1998, you went to Harajuku and it was all Japanese consumers. It was just Japanese youth buying stuff. And so if you said, uh, what are the trends in Japan? You would go to Harajuku and say, okay, people are wearing this, they're wearing this. And if you go to Harajuku now, it's all Asian tourists. There are no Japanese people on the weekends there. I mean, if they're there, they're a minority. And so Japan's, Fashion industry seems to be robust because people are buying stuff, but it's not local audiences. And so the demand to uh, keep up with fashion and buy stuff and make sure you're wearing the right things, that was what was driving magazine sales and readership, and now that pressure's really off. Um, there was a big kind of turning point at about 2006 or seven when everyone had to have a Louis Vuitton bag. There was a time when just like, you had to have a luxury handbag. And then they started including these canvas bags from this brand. Uh, brand. It's, it's called C-H-E-R, but it's not Shandor in, in, in Japanese. And these canvas bags that came with the magazine for free. And so they started giving away these magazines to get people to buy, uh, giving the handbags away. And girls started wearing those free bags. And then suddenly everyone was wearing those instead of Louis Vuitton. And it was kind of like, hey, we don't have to wear Louis Vuitton anymore. And like, Louis Vuitton just went into a, a closet somewhere and you never saw them again. Um, and so that was a big moment where it's just like the need to consume it to prove that you're middle class disappeared and all you had to do was have just a bag that was canvas. Um, and I think that's where we are now, where just, there's not that much pressure. There's pressure to kind of dress nicely, but the pressure to own a bunch of fancy stuff is gone. And uh, that doesn't uh, bode well for the future magazines. But, well, um, <laughs> because they're consumer guides, right? There aren't like, um, What's, what's John Irving up to these days? You know, it's like it's not that. So uh, we we will see, but I'm uh, I'm optimistic that enough of them will survive, and that I think some of them will internationalize into the digital and, and, and figure out that business model. Okay, thank you so much, and we'll have time for questions.